Good morning, church. If you're like me, you can't wait till this is over and the church doors are back open. We'll get right into the lesson for time's sake. I uh, want to say, first of all, thank you, Zach and Jenna, for what you're doing with this. <clears throat> Lighters people a lot more smarter than I am to be able to do this. So this lesson is out of Psalms chapter 2. The lesson in Scripture starts off with a question a question that we all sometimes might ask at one point, and that's question why. If most of us tell the truth, we frequently ask the question <clears throat> when we look at our at certain tragedies, evil, heartbreak, sickness, disease, and corruption, <clears throat> corruption that sometimes defines the world that we live in right now. It'd be easy to ask, <clears throat> or say you don't ask, but nevertheless, you still wonder in the back of your mind, why does God permit evil and suffering in this world? Why does God allow people to be his enemies or to be enemies of him and curse him and profane his holy name? So why does God let innocent people suffer but the hands of evildoers? <coughs> so the psalm starts out, with a question why but God offers a response to the question God says you don't find the answer in the question by looking around the world but where you'll find it is to look forward to the fulfillment of God's <clears throat> divine plan for the human race over my past 22 years of my job I've seen my fair share of wickedness and I've always wondered <clears throat> about the little children, women that get physically, sexually, mentally mistreated. It's been hard on me and, I, and I've never asked the question, but I've obviously had it in the back of my mind. And that's always been somewhat of a stumbling block for me. It's kept me up at night, night after night after night, and I've always wondered why. <clears throat> I'll give you the advice I took from a preacher a couple months ago after my family went through a tragedy. And he said, don't ever trade what you don't know for what you do know. And I agree with that 100%. God's ways, God's thoughts are a lot higher than ours. So Psalms chapter 2 verse 1, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? So in this scripture, heathen most likely would represent a nation of people that are a common language same geographical boundaries, probably the same political government. And throughout the Old Testament, it's likely that the Gentile is, would refer to the Gentile nation, <clears throat> for those who did not recognize or worship God. So the scripture uses the word people in the plural sense, which likely, likely represents the tribe or a people from a particular nation. So in Bible history, you always had nations who were often at odds with each other, who had different political interest, moral interest, religious interest, and they all followed different pagan gods. <clears throat> but for this purpose, these people that were odds against each other would often unite for the common cause to defy God. Enemies were willing to set aside their differences and their interest to form an alliance, thinking they could overthrow God. And in all instances, their labor to rise up against God would always be in vain. So verse 2, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord <clears throat> and against his anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords <coughs> from us. Excuse me. So in verse 2, Scripture uses a text against his anointing, which is a term used in the Old Testament that refers to the priest or prophets or kings. The anointed ones were consecrated by God for God. But it finds its full fulfillment in the New Testament when a promised Redeemer came, which was Jesus Christ. Most the theologians consider Psalms 2 a messianic psalm, and that Christ is the full view here. 
And the New Testament supports that a lot. Acts chapter 2, 29 through 36 makes it really clear. I'm going to do a lot of scripture reading in this. Starting at verse 29 in Acts chapter 2. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you, Patriarch David, that he both is dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the <clears throat> fruit of his loins, <coughs> according to the flesh, he would rise up against Christ. He would raise up Christ, sorry, to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are, we all are witnesses. Therefore, being the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye know, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heaven, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom he hath crucified, both the Lord and Jesus, <clears throat> Lord and Christ. And again in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, Peter and John knew the psalmist fulfillment when the Jewish and Roman leaders conspired to crucify Christ. <coughs> Acts chapter 4, 25, who by the mouth of the servant David has said, why did the heathen rage? See, this refers back to Psalms 2. Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rules were gathered, rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against the holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together <clears throat> for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. So rebellious people view themselves as slaves chained against their will to God's law, and it keeps them from living the way that they, it, <clears throat> it keeps them from living the way that they want. But really, when you think about it, God's law, his ways, his law was created out of his love. His laws are only to protect us from the sin that kills us. You may be, you may rebel against God, but you'll never win it. <clears throat> Even when the Jewish council was plotting against the apostles to have them executed for preaching Christ. Gamaliel of the <clears throat> Pharisees warned them in Acts chapter 5. He said, Now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone, for if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come <coughs> to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily you be found <coughs> to fight against God. Now, in the next few verses, God himself is speaking, and he gives an answer to David's question of why. In verse 4, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. <coughs> then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Throughout all the rebellion against God, <coughs> You get a picture here that he's still seated at the power and unshaken. God's not concerned about the rebellion of men or any group of people or any nation. He's not alarmed <clears throat> and coming up with a plan of action because people want to rebel against him. As a matter of fact, he doesn't even rise to the occasion. He's still seated on his throne. God's not disturbed. And he continues to sit on the throne without interruption. And even better than that, he laughs at the rebellion. In verse 5, God's amusement, though, turns to anger as he would vex them. Vex means to tremble from within. <coughs> and his wrath has not come to fulfillment yet, but it is a gathering storm cloud. In verse 6, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill Zion. So I love how verse 6 sets up verse 7. The Lord did not say a king 
or the king. He said, my king. The scripture reveals the close relationship between him and his anointed king. Verse 7, I'll declare... <coughs> I'll declare the decree the Lord hath <coughs> said unto me, Thou art my son. <coughs> this day have I begotten thee. God sets forth his proclamation for the king who is his son. So in verse 7, you have the son of God responding. He reveals a promise from God, the father that occurred before the foundation of the world was laid. The Son of God will become the sacrifice for the sins of the world. So in verse 8, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. So the birthright of Christ was to rule over the entire earth. He left a perfect atmosphere in heaven to become a man so that he might redeem humanity and the earth. And because of the sacrifice of the only begotten Son of God, Christ is to inherit the earth that he died to redeem. Verse 9, thou, art, <clears throat> thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Verse 10, be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. <clears throat> be wise and listen to the warnings, is warning. A, <clears throat> it's a stark warning to those who oppose the will of God. Simply put, you'll never be able to stand it. It's a warning to the, power, <clears throat> to the powerful people of the world who are full of pride, leaders who think they're invincible, judges who think they can never be overturned. God sounds a trumpet of warning here. <clears throat> God has already revealed what, he, <clears throat> what the future holds, <clears throat> how the world would end, <clears throat> who will prevail, and certainly what will happen to those who defy him. Verse 11, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Proverbs 9 and 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the, whole, <clears throat> of the holy is understanding. If you fear the Lord and respect him, then you'll learn his holiness, his power, his knowledge, his wisdom, and his judgment. If you fear the Lord, you'll want a relationship with him. If you don't fear the Lord, you only live in dread and terror. Been there. Scripture instructs us to rejoice with trembling. Rejoice because God loves you. Rejoice because he's redeemed you. Because he's long-suffering and he's kind and he's patient. And he has a reward that he'll bring with him. <clears throat> Last scripture, verse 12. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish from the way when the wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Lastly, the scripture says to kiss the son. Kiss is a symbol of both affection and submission in the Old Testament. It's an act of worship and a sign of surrender. To escape the wrath of God, you must worship the son. The Greek word for worship here means to come forward and kiss. And the only way to have a relationship with God is through receiving his son. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And that's my lesson. <clears throat>